On today's program, we hear more from Dr. Jeffrey Seif and Dr. Michael Brown as we look for modern applications from the book of Jeremiah. Coming up next on Our Jewish Roots. In the sixth century BC, one man stood alone against the pervading wickedness of God's people in the land of Judah. The prophet Jeremiah was chosen by the Lord to warn of pending judgment that would come at the hands of the Babylonians. Visions of an exile left him heartbroken and in tears. But Jeremiah remained faithful to his calling and recorded a message that would speak to generations yet to come. Standing tall with faith in God, he understood better days were coming. And there was hope over the horizon. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. And I am Jeffrey Seif. And it's been such a great series all about Jeremiah. You're teaching always amazing. Yes. We love being at this desk with you all the time. Well, you're kind. Dr. Michael Brown, we really enjoyed him too. So you guys have known each other for a while. Tell us about yeah, we, your we, relationship with we him. We had a sit down and I was just glad to have him participating in the series. But uh, uh, he and I worked for the same Bible college or different campuses and uh, we have that professional association. My first memory of him goes back to sitting down with him and he had a Hebrew Bible and wanted to fellowship with me in the Bible. Now, I mean, I don't hold a candle to him with the language mm. and uh, you know, I can make my way with the language, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just minor league. He's major league and an all-star at that, really. He's, he's really one of the best of the best. And uh, I've known him for decades, and I'm working with him now uh, beyond the television series, Zondervan, a major publisher, Christian publisher, and a Bible publisher, uh, is doing a study Bible that he's the general editor of. And uh, I'm working on three books for that, so. Mm. And we get, I, I like, I like, something extra, I like a bonus. This is our bonus program for Jeremiah, special interviews that you had with Dr. Brown. Yeah, and he wrote a significant commentary on Jeremiah. I didn't know that when I pitched to him, hey, hey, John, hey uh, Mike, do you wanna come and help? And oh, by the way, yes, and then bingo, I hit pay dirt on the quick. All right, that's coming up, isn't it? It is. Like right now. Yes, so without further ado, <laughs> off we go to Dr. Michael Brown. Michael Brown, I'm so thrilled to be able to sit down with you, my friend. Always great to be with you, Jeff. Yeah, it's been a number of years, hasn't it? it has been. Speaking of years and going back years, we're looking at Jeremiah. You did a commentary on Jeremiah. What led you to do that? Well, for years, I, I had loved the prophetic burden of Jeremiah. And I had related it on a certain level to, to you carry the, the pain of a burden. You see something's wrong in the situation around you. And, and your only outlet is really to the Lord. So when I was asked to contribute a commentary to an Old Testament series, they were revising some older ones and rewriting and brand new ones were coming in. Uh, I put Jeremiah at the top of my list and the editor said to me, I had Jeremiah at the top of the list for you as well. So I virtually got to live with the prophet for several years and it, yeah. it was extraordinary. Well, you live with him and in a certain sense you live like him, at least in the sense you're very forthright and direct and passionate. So I could see uh, how you could relate to the character. Yeah, and, and any of us that have a prophetic burden, not meaning that we're having visions and dreams about the future or, or writing books of the Bible, but, but we have that burden that something's wrong and it needs to change. The, the message of repent is, is deep, deep in our hearts. And that word occurs over and over and over in Jeremiah. And it ties in with words of return, the exiles return, you repent, you return. If, when those themes are real to you, and when you have a burden for your nation that sometimes reduces you to tears, and a, a burden for the Jewish people, in ways you can relate to Jeremiah, and all of us as God's people, Jesus tells us that when we bear reproach for the gospel, we're being treated the way the prophets were being treated. So as followers of Yeshua, we, we swim against the tide, we go against the grain. In that sense, we can relate to Jeremiah. 
Yeah, and in that sense, and believe me, I don't want to give you a Hebrew lesson <laughs> for viewers that are watching. They don't know you. You know, he, you, for your PhD, eleven Semitic languages, correct? Yeah, a bunch uh, dialects I, and different I, things. I, yeah, I, I don't want to fake it with you. My understanding is the word navi, etymologically for prophet, comes from a word meaning to bubble forth, and I liken it in the sense of someone drinks Seven Up. There's gas. There's something deep inside, and it needs to come out. You alighted upon that in Jeremiah's day. Today, do you think a lot of God's people have stuff in there. There's a word, there's a moment. We live in times today much like Jeremiah, correct? So what's really interesting in Jeremiah is that in the 20th chapter, he comes to a breaking point. Every so often, he'd come to a breaking point privately, never publicly, never flinched publicly, never backed down from a single word. But sometimes like, God, this is enough. This is too much. I, it's too costly for me to bring this word. Family turns to me. I get hit violently. I'm just trying to obey you. Everybody hates me. So he says, I decided, Jeremiah 20, I'm just going to keep quiet. I will not speak his word anymore. He said he can't live that way. However. Can't live. He said, your word was like fire in my bones. Now, and to that point, he's noted as the weeping prophet, very effusive, emotive. We know more about him than other prophets because there's a lot of self-disclosure in the way he speaks, correct? Yeah, so we have a lot of glimpses. We know far more about the person of Jeremiah than any other prophet. And a lot of the book is first person. Some of it's third person about him, but a lot of it is first person. And, and what would bring him to a breaking point also was the hard words he had to bring. For example, in Jeremiah 15, he's prophesying about the woman of seven is going to die. The mother of seven is going to die. And this one's going to die. It's like, I didn't ask for this, Lord. I, 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 didn't, I never pursued this. You pursued me. And you know what God says to him? He doesn't say, Jeremiah, I understand. He says, if you repent, I'll use you. It's like, I don't want to be used. But God knew deep down in Jeremiah's heart, he really wanted to be. So the, the, the pain that he expresses towards God, it shows us that as strong as he was publicly, he was a very sensitive man. Yes, he was. He wasn't one that just, I don't care. I'm going to bring these hard words. It broke his yeah, heart, yeah. which is telling us it's costly to carry the burden of the Lord. You know, as, as a teacher, I always want students as a Bible professor, just to try and look at a text in its context. I'm really interested in the moment. It, it's hard to resist the temptation to read Jeremiah right into today because truth be known, a lot of people are burdened, they're grieved, they're upset, there's a word, they wanna speak, it's harsh about culture, but they don't like it. What do you think? So Jeremiah tells us we must have courage. Jeremiah tells us we must obey. Jeremiah tells us that we lose our personhood and value and dignity when we compromise for the sake of convenience. It's, it's what Jesus himself taught. If you save your life, you lose it. You become a slave to the opinions of people. You become a slave to the, to the times and the seasons as opposed to being God's servant. So the words of Jeremiah continue through all eternity. We, we read them, we study them as God's word. What about the words of the false prophets? What do we think about the ones who said, Shalom, Shalom, Ve'en Shalom, all is well, all is well, peace, peace, when nothing's well, when there is no peace? Their names are despised. Hananiah, the false prophet who dies. And Jeremiah even says, the ones who prophesy peace and safety, they're the unusual ones. You know their words are true when they come to pass because all the other prophets have predicted judgment. Why? Because of the sin of the people. So if we think we can just coast by, smiling, laughing, happy all the time, we don't have the heart of God. He does give us joy. He does give us peace. He does give us intimacy. But boy, he wants us to carry a burden. And that means sharing his heart. Yes. And there's a lot of happy clappy, but we live in tough times. Yeah. And uh, we need to be able to speak to, for, and about it. Not just to it, but through it. Now, to your point earlier, it is true. This weeping prophet, uh, I mean, what makes the good news so good is that the bad news is so bad. I mean, he lived in tough times, but he saw over the horizon the better days coming, didn't he? Yeah, so much of his book, most of his book is doom, judgment, gloom. But then there always are these words of encouragement. And then chapters 30 through 33 have been called the book of consolation because it's good news after good news after good news being presented. And Jeremiah has four verses, Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34 in our English Bibles that prophesy this new covenant that God will make with the house of Israel and Judah. And Yeshua at the Last Supper says, this is what I'm implementing through my death, through my blood. And then this is the longest single passage quoted in the New Testament. It's quoted in its entirety in the book of Hebrews. So the one that brings the new covenant prophecy that Yeshua inaugurates with his death and resurrection is the weeping prophet. 
Those who sow with tears reap with joy. And to the degree that, that we plant our seeds with tears of prayer and brokenness and intercession is to the degree that we will reap with great joy and satisfaction. Dr. Brown mentioned the burden Jeremiah had of the words that were in his belly that had the fire that he had to get out. And I know you've taught the Bible for many years. You've, you've brought the word many years on our program. Throughout all that time, is there something, a fire in your belly, yes, that you feel you have to get out? Yes, but I'm a little different than Dr. Brown in that regard. He started a school called Fire School of Ministry. Ooh. He is he's just passionate on steroids, and he's an evangelist that so happened to pick up a PhD uh, that includes 11 different languages. For me, the principal burden uh, as a Bible teacher is to be a Jewish studies professor. For me, I'm very much interested in looking at the good news through the eyes of the Jews. And I'm not saying that because I'm on a television set uh, and, a, and a program that tells that kind of story, but that's what I've been all about in the classroom as a teacher. That's that fire in your belly that you just have to get out. I want to help Jewish people come to know Jesus and I want to help Jesus people come to know Jews. Oh, that burns. Yes, and I love that there's something inside that has to come out. Yes, right now let's go back to our interview. So you're a guy, you had the opportunity to, to write on a number of things, and you have written on a number of things, and your website's there on the air, and people can learn about Ask Dr. Michael Brown, and I'm asking uh, Dr. Michael Brown. Uh, you stepped into Jeremiah, you could rate, relate to him personally, correct? As a human being, the passion, the fire of God, the difficulties. Yeah, and reading Jeremiah 23, beginning in verse 9, it's the oracle to the false prophets. It just says, La Nevi'im, to the prophets, but it means to the false prophets. And Jeremiah is staggered. He's staggering around like a drunken man because he's so overwhelmed by the holy words of God when he sees what the false prophets are doing and how they are destroying the nation. And I remember reading that decades ago in Hebrew on my knees and literally being staggered by the words, being completely overcome by the burden of the Lord. So there was something, no, I'm not a Jeremiah, I'm not a prophet like he was, but there's something that I've identified with. And then sometimes, even if you have friends, family around you, you feel like you're the only one with the message. You know you're not. You know God has a family and burden out, and body out there. But sometimes the burden's so intense, it feels like no one else sees it, no one else feels it. And, and, and that, that sensitivity where, where God speaks, Jeremiah speaks, it goes back and forth, and it's all in the first person. As, as my wife Nancy said when I was writing the commentary, talking about it, she said, sometimes you can't tell where God ends and the prophet begins and vice versa. That's how right. it is with us in the Lord, that, that we're one with Him, we identify with Him. You know, it seems that uh, for me in you know, opting to jump in and throw my hat in the ring to do the Jeremiah story for a television program. And by the way, thank you for participating with me when we went through those little vignettes and we went through the series oh, yeah. earlier. This is just the wrap on it. But part of the genesis for me is he seemed like so much a man for our times. In the times, shifting political currents, where are you going to stand, standing up for God's word, um, you, you know, kind of staving off the political correctness to keep your integrity in a spiritual sense. It seems so much the kind of pressures that we're all feeling today. Those of us that yeah. have the Lord in us that want the Lord to shine through us. He lived in a very real spiritual cancel culture. It didn't have the same media issues then, but people were trying to silence him. They did not like what he had to say. Out of the gate, when God called him, he could well be a you know, teenager when he's called. He could be 15, 16 years old. We, we don't know the exact age. You may have had a, a different figure on it. But I never put a figure on yeah, it. Yeah, he's, he's just a young guy. He's a Na'ar in Hebrew. And he's like, I don't even know how to speak. And you've got the senior prophets out there. You've got the wise men. You've got the priests. You, you've got the elders. And now he's going to prophesy contrary to what they're all saying. They're all going right. to be against. Who in the world do you think you are? But God put his words in his mouth. And even his own family turned against him. That's another breaking point, end of Jeremiah 11. And that's where he complains to God early in Jeremiah 12. We soften it in our translations, but he's basically saying, I don't like the way you run your universe, God. I'm right. going to bring charges against you. And God's response to him is, hey, Jeremiah, you're getting worn out running with the footman. What are you going to do with the horseman? Right. You, you can't take it in your home city of Anatole, a small town. What are you going to do in Jerusalem? And then God comforts him and encourages him. But he, he's up again. Who, who are you to speak 
That's where we find ourselves today. Just be quiet and everything will be fine. Just mm. conform to the norm and bow to the gods of this age and life will go well for you. That's the lie of Satan that every generation hears. A lot of bad stuff worked its way into GD and culture, idol worship being one. You know, some of these kings hopped in bed with the devil and uh, Jeremiah's world is reaping what they sowed, correct? Yeah, idolatry was really the root turning away from the true God and worshiping false gods and everything else flowed out of that sexual immorality, injustice, child sacrifice, it all flowed out of idolatry. We say, we don't have that today. We're not bowing down to, to gods of, of, of wood and stone. Well, we have every kind of idol, everything else that we give our attention to, whether it's our, our addiction to sports, whether it's our, our obsession with entertainment, whether it's looking to people, whether it's, the Paul says that greed is idolatry. So idolatry is still here in so many different forms. Anything that takes the worship and attention and adoration and energy that should be given over to God and gives it over to something else, that's idolatry. Well, if I understand you correctly, you're saying, okay, look, you watch your football game, but if it's happening during church, record it, go to church and watch it later. Don't put it first. Or, or how, about, how about this? Be more grieved over the fact that your neighbor is lost and, and, and that your, your grandson is a drug addict. Be more grieved over that than the fact that your team lost yesterday. If, if you can spend hours and hours and hours every single day playing video games and don't read your Bible in a week, something is out of order. That's true. Something needs to shift. And you're being gracious. It's not just video games. If you look at the hours people spend with their little cell phones but don't have time to read a scripture, it really is. Exactly. I, I have time to respond to every text, but I don't have time to pray or memorize a scripture <laughs> verse. Something's out of order. Idolatry can be subtle. Idolatry can be overt. Either way, what's capturing our hearts. That's the God we worship. Well, the, the theologian Michael Brown says, answer your texts, but make sure you respond to biblical text. Amen. I love it. I trust that you are all enjoying this extra bonus program, this interview with Dr. Michael Brown as much as we are. We love it, yes. He is so good, he's very insightful, and the way we bring it to you is through faithful donations of all our viewers. So in Hebrew they say toda or toda raba, which means thank you very much. You are making all of this possible. Stay with us, we'll be right back. For many, a trip to the Holy Land is the dream of a lifetime. Where else can you go see the scriptures come alive as you visit the sites where so many biblical events happened? We invite you to come on a Zola tour in the spring or the fall as we explore Israel and Petra. Reserve your dream of a lifetime. Contact us for more information. We've enjoyed bringing you this last series all about Jeremiah. If you've missed any of the programs, there's a great way that you can go back and find these programs online. Right. We are literally all over social media. Do you at, it's a fancy symbol, it's probably right below us right now, at Our Jewish Roots. You can go on our ministry website, levitt.com or levitt.tv. I know that's a lot of information, but gosh, you can, they can watch this whole series. Yes extra interviews. We have some special things that we just put on social media just for you. Right now, let's go back to our interview. I always try and take pains to look at the nuances in the literature that give the background to it. And it's a precarious, changing world. The climate is very tempestuous in Jeremiah's day, much like our own, correct? Yeah, everything was up for grabs. It was about a hundred years earlier that Assyria crushed the northern tribes of Israel and, and almost took out Judah. God miraculously intervened for Hezekiah. It's not all that long later. Basically that happens in 722 BC and Jeremiah begins to prophesy in 627 BC. So it's not even a hundred years and now there's the new threat from Babylon and Jeremiah is told out of the gate, your nation's going down. There's this sense today that if we don't have great revival in America, our nation may implode from within, or we may fall to people from without. There's this sense of urgency, a life and death moment, and we're really in it. Well, let's unpack that a little, because people are living with a fear, and a lot of fear is unreasonable, but this isn't an unreasonable fear. People are thinking, goodness, our nation 
is dissipating, it's evaporating, its moral fabric is disintegrating. And people fear for that. Uh, Jeremiah did much the same, didn't he? Yeah, and, and one of the great issues of our day is abortion. One of the great issues of Jeremiah's day was the slaughtering of babies, sacrificing them to Molech. You can read about it in Jeremiah 7 and Jeremiah 19. And that one thing, which happened a lot uh, under the leadership of, of, of Manasseh, 55 years king of Judah, Billy Graham once called him the most wicked man that ever lived, and certainly was, was a terrible sinner that found repentance at the end of his life. But his sins were so great that in Jeremiah 15, God says, even though I forgave him, I can't forgive the nation for all the bloodshed. It, it is to the sins that were committed under him were such, the shedding of innocent blood. This is now for living babies that, that were, were burned alive and in, in, in offered to, to Moloch. God said, that sin alone, I'm going to destroy the nation. But is there any good news from ancient Jews? I mean, Jeremiah um, lived in a world, again, different circumstances, but not unlike it at the emotional level. His world was in a vice, but he, he, he had advice for the world, didn't he? Yeah, the, the first reality is for every one of us, we can take refuge in God. For every one of us personally, we can have such a rock solid relationship with him. Scripture says the righteous will not be shaken. We don't have to be shaken by what's happening around us. Yeshua says that when all these things are happening and it's getting really bad, even worse than now, and you know that my return is near, people are having heart attacks for fear of what's coming. You should be rejoicing because I'm coming back. That's me, the reality. Let me pivot and ask you about just not being shaken. Um, you had mentioned earlier in the interview, in the conversation about how, you know, Jeremiah had experienced trouble with his own family. Some of us, you know, we raise kids and we're shaken to the core because of the, the abandonment, the disrespect, the, the disintegration of the family. Uh, I suspect people that are watching, I know in my age bracket, when I, when I talk to parents and grandparents, they're, they're upset because of the irreverence and disrespect. How can we not be shaken in a world where we think that's what we, what we love is, be, is shaking us? It does shake us initially, just as Jeremiah was shaken. And, and it is shocking to see somehow things have just turned upside down and what used to be normal is, is abnormal and what used to be expected is now exceptional and we, we're seeing things we've never seen before, dealing with things we've never had to deal with before. But the lesson from Jeremiah is you do get shaken, which drives you deeper in God. It drives you to this place of desperation because yesterday's methods aren't cutting it. We have to find something new in God. And that's why Jeremiah made it to the end. That's why he never cracked. That's why he never backslid. That's why he never did anything that they could ever point a finger at and find him guilty. God sustained him. The same God who sustained Jeremiah, if we run to him and put all our trust in him and our fear and our pain and our anxiety and really throw ourselves on him like Jeremiah did, we will find the same comfort, hope, strength to endure, and we will not be shaken. You know, I think you're right. There's those old verses that... I say old, I mean, all verses are old, but, but they used to be represented to audience more so. You know, I know that my Redeemer lives and at last he will stand upon the earth. Even if you don't have the answer, I know God is the answer. And, you know, I'm just going to press through the turbulence of trying times and trust in him. Jeremiah certainly had to do that. And he needed to do it in his day. We got to do it in ours, correct? Yeah, if Jeremiah were speaking to us as believers, as those who really want to follow him, I believe he would look at us and say, God is faithful. God is true. Every word he promised will come to pass. You'll go through dark times, but trust me, the light will prevail. Amen. That is a fantastic way to wrap up our whole series on Jeremiah. I don't know why, you guys. I always get a little sad at the end of another series. <laughs> it's like we lived with these people. We walked with Jeremiah, and now kind of done, sad. You know, to that point, and by the way, it's, it's not scripted, uh, about living with these people. I know for me, before I ever do a series, I really try and climb into the world. I want to be there. I want to feel it. Of course, it's easier to do it when you're actually going to the place, to Israel. But I, I want to climb into their heads and, and, and hear their words and feel their thoughts and, and let what emerges emerge out of that. You picked, uh, and we've talked about why you might have picked Jeremiah. 
out of the whole Bible, why was that the person that you picked out and said this time for his story to be told on our program? Because when my producer, when our producer, Ken Berg, said, let's do Isaiah, I said, we already did it, let's do Jeremiah. Uh, I mean, any pick of the Bible is good. Uh, it's good. But uh, I, I just really thought that, that, that it's a message for the moment, to tell you the truth. And I'm so vexed. Uh, Jeremiah was vexed when he considered the state of affairs in his own culture. And personally, I'm distressed um, when, when, when I look at the news. You know, it really bothers me deeply. Uh, my wife, Barry, doesn't want to look at it. I look at it and want to throw up. Jeremiah had those same thoughts. There was a lot of darkness back in that day that we've seen this whole series. There's a lot of darkness in our world today but we're called to be his light and hope for the world. Yes. You've been doing it your whole life in ministry uh, as a minister of music, correct? Easy uh, to get discouraged, yeah. but he's called all of us to be his light. I mean, you know people come to church and they carry the burdens and you want to connect to them and take them to somewhere else. You know, I was going to say, uh, jumping on that, that's what you do. Uh, we t we've talked about Jeremiah's fire in his belly, what he had to get out. And I think, and I'm just speaking as your wife, but I am your wife, that you have such a burning passion for people to worship in all ages. And uh, we all have a, a different fire and words that the Lord puts in us that we have to get out. I think that's part of our calling and our mission on this earth. Right. It manifests differently because we have different personalities, but that's not the point. Michael Brown is a frustrated evangelist that so happened to get a PhD. <laughs> you know, he has all that passion and, and it manifests in the way that he communicates, you know, and, uh, and David, I mean, we all have different personalities. I'm a little more intense and I think that, that, that you're more of a staid, respectable individual, you know, but, uh, but your passion propelled you into the Lord's work and, and you can and light up a fire when you engage a community and lift them up in song. I try. Jeremiah wept a lot. I feel like I do that once in a while when I see people that aren't engaging in, in that hope. You really, I mean, you see it and feel it I there. Do. And uh, you're trying to take them to another place. You want them to see and experience something. We are the light of the world. Yes, we are. Yes. And you, uh, Jeremiah, Michael Brown, me, we, we're all in the same boat. Let's lift him up. And I just, I'm jumping in because I want to say thank you for yes. your insight, your wisdom to bring Jeremiah's word to our Jewish roots. We're thankful for you. Well, you're kind to do it. And I wouldn't be bringing it to you if you didn't enable us. And thank you so much. And you all come back now here. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Until then, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you.